This day has come, the 39th International Conference of Linguistics Society of India. And 39 is a very big milestone coming to think of it. So we have come a long, long way. And uh, it's, it's really nice to see that how we have grown in the University Society of India since 1928. Um, that was the time when the University Society of India was instituted. And then it, in 1931, this was in Lahore, and it was instituted at the Fifth Oriental uh, Conference. And then in 1931, it was moved to Kolkata. And a few years after that, it was moved in 56 to Pune. And since then, we have been operating from Pune. But since 1928 to this day, I mean, that's a long, long time. So you can see how I'm very happy to be here on this 39th uh, conference. And uh, I will tell about this uh, uh, more uh, because we have done quite a bit. But let me begin once first with thanking IIT Patna to host this 39th, uh, as people children generally say, equal C, equal C, 39. I'm very, very happy to the uh, organizers, especially Shweta Sinha and the dean. Uh, Dr. Iqbal, Smriti Singh, and uh, the invisible <laughs> director Pushpa Bhattacharya, I was looking forward to seeing him, but I can see that without his direction we would have been able to move ahead. So I'm really, very really thankful to IIT Patna to host this, and uh, coming to IIT Patna almost seemed like going for field work because we did cross several, literally several fields to come here. That, that was a nice, pleasant experience. But above all, uh, I would like to thank, uh, and when I say I, I don't mean I as an individual, I mean I as a president of the Linguistic Society of India. The society would like to thank the Central Institute of Indian Languages because the, without their support, financially, physically, psychologically, and boosting our morale all the time when we felt down even 10 years ago or 20 years ago has been amazing. So I'm very, very thankful to CIL, but especially this year to Dr. Uh, B.G. Rao, because he, as he said in his speech, he's very new. But you must have realized that his newness has bring new enthusiasm, a new force into the running of the society. And not only just the financial support, whatever we ask for or whatever we want to go ahead in future, the support comes immediately. So I'm very thankful to Dr. Rao, Professor Rao, for, uh, and he says, I'm not a linguist, he's, uh, he's from the science, and all the more better that we have a person from the science background to give us all the help. So this is uh, this is very important that we have him. And he's, I think this, there's another interesting aspect or another milestone that you know, I haven't seen CIL directors attending the ecology conferences you know, very often. I won't say that this is an exception, but not very often. And in that sense, he has come all the way from Mysore. Thank you, Professor Rao, for following us. I'm also very thankful to our plenary speakers, uh, and quite a few are sitting right here, Professor Pandey, Professor Subarao, Karen Ferry, Caroline Ferry, and others who have uh, agreed to come and address all the young people and old also. So I'm very thankful of the plenary speakers. But and also the paper readers, there are quite a few. So you have a four-day affair jam-packed, back to back. So that's very really good. You have a large number of paper readers. But above all, I'm also thankful to the listeners. You know, without the listeners, nothing will go on. As you know, in oral tradition uh, in Marathi, whenever the narration is, uh, is uh, uh, uttered or presented, you need two people. One is Kehenkar, the other is Ahenkar. Without the person who says ha 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 and asks questions, you just cannot continue, right? If a person doesn't ask the question, kya hua, to, the, 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 the narrator cannot continue. So the two uh, components of any oral tradition is very important. And conference is nothing but another venue or other, other genre of oral tradition. So here we are continuing our oral tradition. So I'm very thankful to the listeners also who have come here from various uh, different, I can see my students. But all my ex-students are on the right hand side. I don't want to be like this. <laughs> so you can also spread on the right hand side. <laughs> so it's nice to see them after many years. So this is, I'm 
thankful to all those who are uh, really gracing the occasion. Uh, please convey my thanks to Professor Bhattacharya also, uh, whenever I have been Since 1931, or like that, so since 1928, we have come a long way in exploring, analyzing, discovering, and documenting Indian languages. However, we have not succeeded fully what our founders of the society envisaged for the languages and society of India, that is, to build scientific jumper about the discipline. And I will quote from the preamble that we had in 1928. It said, the advancement of Indian linguistics and scientific study of Indian languages. So this component is still not fully being satisfied. And if we have more people like Professor G.S. Rao uh, shaking hands with us, I'm sure things will change and they will change for better. So this is, uh, this is the thing that we have to develop, the scientific temper. I talked about this in my last uh, policy also, uh, but uh, I do not know how much progress has been made since then. Since human language represents ancient history of human civilization and migration, and cognitive structure of human brain, studying languages open new doors for scientific, scientific research in several disciplines. Studying lesser known languages, especially lesser known because they are, we yet do not know the structures, is an interdisciplinary affair and it really feeds at best information to disciplines such as biology, cognitive science, anthropology, culture, history, and population genetics. And this we have known by our past research that this is what it is true. It also informs us of the diversity of languages and their structures. An inquiry into possible human language. And this is a very, very uh, important uh, inquiry which right now it's a lot of linguists, anthropologists, scientists, and mathematical modelers are involved in finding out what could have been possible human language. So that is, this is a thing which is linking us to the human evolution, whether the biological factor of the vocal apparatus, but also the cognitive structure of the brain. So this is very important that we must uh, continue our inquiry into what could have been possible <coughs> human language. Uh, and this cannot be answered, this question cannot be answered unless we do more and more studies of those languages which have been marginalized, which have not been part of the mainstream, which have been considered small languages, and which have been considered minor languages. They are no longer, they are no, my students know that I don't believe this major minor distinction because they are minor because of the political uh, decisions. So these languages are very important and one has to uh, study these to answer these kind of questions. These days, Documentation has become a buzzword. Everybody wants to do documentation. There are a lot of funding available. There are a lot of organizations available. But how many of us really know what is documentation? It's a very specialized field. It needs training. And it needs some kind of know-how which is very intimately related to computational linguistics, from artificial intelligence, from various kinds of programming, and so on and so forth including what linguists have been doing all along, that is recording the data and sifting the data. So the, the documentation on its own is not important. Documentation gives us information, and information gives us knowledge. And it is the end product, the knowledge that is important, because through that knowledge, we can also think of reviving languages. We can also think of finding out how the languages are being construed. And when I say reviving languages are possible through this knowledge, we already have examples. You know, Maori had been dead for quite some years in Australia. It is totally revived. And I met some Maori speakers this time in Canada, and I was quite surprised. They were not only speaking the language, they were being able to have the dialogues. There's another story of Haida. I had a little stint with Haida, teaching Haida in Vancouver. You can also attend the university in, um, you know, Mark in the uh, Science Science University. And I realized that Haida is very well documented from France Boas onwards. So we have dictionary, we have grammar, we have audio recordings. We don't, they don't have video recordings, but perhaps the video machines are not available. 
But there are, I visited Haida village and I realized that the elders are sitting in a class and going through the very, very documented uh, you know, text and trying to learn the language through that. And some of them have started singing or establishing dialogues. So the knowledge feeds into revivalism. And not only that, we just also sometimes emerge the enthusiasm about uh, coming back to your language. My experience with Bajan Nimanis had been this. When I was working on Bajan Nimanis, the language was almost on the verge of death. There was only five. When I started, there were 10 speakers, but towards the end, when I left the community, there were only five. But during my years of interaction, I realized that they, I mean, they, they experienced the kind of honor the language used to have. So they started speaking again, or they tried to speak again, and trying to teach the children. So this is an important aspect of documentation that we must understand. And that's why all the documentation projects should be done very seriously and not just for earning money. Modern advances in technology can be used for dissemination of information on language as well as their documentation for posterity. However, I must warn you that don't make, you must avoid making it kind of a commodity. Don't make it a commodification and objectification of language by documenting them. Uh, because it's a living organism. Language, as you know, is a living organism, so it should be treated as a living organism, and uh, the, all the aspects of the living organism should be studied. Uh, the, in the last two decades, the field of documentation has grown a lot, and some of you who are sitting here already know the various kind of aspects that the documentation has, and uh, the, the idea is to have the typical, I would, also, I would put it like this, you know, the language has many genres or many realms, and every realm should be documented because language is not only really used, so people think only if you do dictionary and grammar, you have done documentation. No. If you think of reviving the language, you have to revive even for scrolling. How do you scroll? And there are, I sometimes get questions from various people from around the globe who say, how do you, how do you say get lost in written domains? And then I realized that maybe I did not even think of this for particular aspect, you know, when I was collecting the data. Yes, when you have a language, you love in language, you hate in language, you make somebody, you know, uh, you dishonor in language. Because all these various functions of language that you have in our oral form has to be documented. So that if ever this language has to be revived, it should be revived in the fullest form. How does the mother talk to the child? How does the child respond to the mother? How do brothers talk to the sisters? And so on and so forth. You know, these various aspects of the oral uh, speech should be documented. And then only we can say that, yes, the language documentation has a <coughs> proper sense. Uh, alongside this core social justice motivation, you know, grammatical descriptions serve an interest for scientific inquiry. And some of the senior linguists sitting here already know about it. Uh, that uh, linguists have argued that the form and functions of all natural language are important means by which we can investigate human evolution, both in vocal apparatus and uh, as well as human language. Given the initial endowment of the species to speak language, because you know language is a species specific actually. So investigating more and more languages leads us to better appreciation of this original endowment and its ability to yield so many distinct outputs. When I say distinct outputs, outputs I mean different kinds of languages, including the varieties, varieties of the same language. So you have to remember that every time a language dies, we have less evidence for understanding patterns in the structure and function of human language, and less evidence for human prehistory and the maintenance of words diverse ecosystems. Conservation biology needs to be paralleled by conservation linguistics. Keep that in mind, and this will all already will bring some scientific temper you know, to your uh, deals. The other aspect is that you know the, somehow we have not been been very successful in making linguistics as an interdisciplinary subject. And uh, ironically, despite being, I mean, despite having linguistics for the last almost 
you know, eighteen years uh, as a part of the LSI. Or if you look at from Parinda's drama, then we had linguistics, you know, for the last one hundred thousand years. Yet, when you tell somebody that I'm a linguist, prompt comes the question: How many languages do you know? <laughs> and then, then you do not know what to say because general masses think linguists are polyglots. Mm -hmm. So they cannot distinguish between a polyglot and a linguist. And every time I have to say, no, 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 I'm not a polyglot. I'm a, I'm a linguist, and I have to explain in two sentences what linguists do. But you have a lot of black people that you may not have seen, but when I was your age, and I went to linguistics in my first year, there was a movie going on in the hall in the Rivoli Cinema in Delhi, which is no longer there, The Sound of Music. Uh, not the sound of music. Yeah, that was sound of music. Just it was based on Pygmalion. That was sound of music. My theory. My theory. Right. That was the movie. This was very hit because this is the days of that uh, you know, play on Pygmalion. So that my theory lady was going on. So every time I had a very easy answer. I said, Have you seen that movie? And generally people will say. I said, yes, we know what Professor Higgins does in, in that movie. And then they will think, oh, it's so difficult or something. It is not that. So this is how you know, we used to at least give some similes. But I'm so sorry to say that despite you know, our indulgence into this discipline and teaching and learning for so many years, we see the masses think that uh, linguists are calling that. But nobody else has to be blamed for this. We ourselves have to be blamed for this because we have not reached at a younger stage level of learning at a school level. We have not reached at a college level. And I'm very happy Dr. Rao mentioned that he is thinking of uh, you know, introducing linguistics as linguistic skills in postgraduate, undergraduate. But I would also say that we should, if, we, if children can learn biochemistry at the age of ninth class or 10th class, why can't they learn linguistics? And linguistics being the biggest living organism that we have, a child learns language by the age of three. Why can't you learn about, about language in schools? In fact, from eight, we learn almost we can do it. And if the government wants the uh, doctor out to be student children, this, none of us would mind writing about linguistics in a very simplistic form. You know, what linguistics is, how, what does it do, what is the object of inquiry, and what does it tell, how is good for the society, and so other things. So this is an important aspect that you know, I wanted to bring up so that, you know, we have some uh, directions for future and we can do it, you know. The, the study of language also relates to literature. And uh, I, this is also unfortunate that many years ago, linguistics was associated with the literature department, but they did not do what they should have done, that is, they should have concentrated on, concentrated on oral literature. You see, there are more than 800 languages in India which are never written down. But have you ever thought that why these languages, these languages which are orally transmitted from one generation to another, have survived despite the holocaust of industrialization, homogenization, and so on, so what's called uh, subjugation of some major language, so called major language? How about it to survive? How come people still want to retain their languages and have retained their languages, whether it, whether it is the Himalayas or Kanchan Jangas? And I realized that the Kanchan Janga, uh, the oral tradition, you know, crosses boundaries, political boundaries. The same narration is of Kanchan Janga is, is relevant in Sikkim, in Bhutan, in Nepal, and other, you know, uh, lower Himalayas. So we, the, the, are these, these kind of oral literature, these kind of narrations, neither know the political boundaries, nor they know these things of what is a major language, what is a minor language. And unfortunately, our literature department never concentrated on this. Because oral tradition, and there are so many genres of oral tradition. If you want to, if you are interested, just look at the UNESCO list of uh, oral tradition. They have given a very large list uh, of oral tradition, which is very, very important for us to realize that all those that uh, we do now in documentation, we somehow miss 50% of that. So this is an important aspect, you know, so the literature also department has something uh, to do with, with linguistics and the language analysis. So it is interdisciplinary in nature in many ways, you know. Uh, the, what the, there are areas, you know, which uh, have been talked about in linguistics, how it touches the biology and population genetics, 
and how it has touched the cognitive aspects. Some of you are already involved in that. And I have certainly hope uh, that in the, in the near future, the, <coughs> the subject linguistics as such will have a much wider and much bigger wings to fly in the sky. And we will be able to uh, give some knowledge. We will certainly take knowledge from other disciplines, but I am hopeful that we will be able to give some knowledge to do these disciplines to modify uh, <clears throat> their things. I do not know how many of you know, but uh, the, the results of alien linguistics, not alien linguistics, alien linguistics, has fed into population genetics games. And what we used to say that, you know, that these are the features of Dravidian languages which have penetrated into Indo-Iranian languages, these are the features of Munda languages penetrated into Indo-Iranian languages. That kind of feedback has helped population genetics to find out the intermarriages or the contact between the two communities. And they have brought out several papers. And uh, the, uh, the, I did give the results of these things in my, in my uh, the policy that we had on uh, in Shillong five, four or five years ago. Uh, we, there is a very interesting uh, paradigm uh, that has emerged because of alien lingu the, the findings of the alien linguistics. And they have now pointed out the age also, what period the aliens came and what period the Dravidians came and whether the community is really intermingled between them because without intermingling you will not have contact features. So the area that Professor Sugara has been working for many, many years on contact and convergence is a very important thing even if you look at your document, you would then be able to, by the help of population genetics, you will be able to help, uh, they identify a particular year as an era when the two communities came uh, into contact. It is, uh, uh, I'm a little, uh, while I'm standing here, maybe I will not get a chance to this is my last year at the, as you all know, as the president of the University Society of India. But as I stand here, I would like to share my anxiety and little agony that the pedagogical aspects of linguistics have changed a lot. You know, no, no department teaches historical linguistics now. There are very few departments who teach a course in writing grammar. There are very few departments who teach aerial linguistics. And there are very few departments who teach uh, subjects uh, which were very important for, for at, least, at least for us when we were growing up, like anthropological linguistics and also sign language linguistics. Now these are the areas you know, which should be part and parcel of any proper full-fledged department of linguistics because these are the base courses. This also, these are the courses which tell you how the human evolution took place and how we as a speaking creatures learned languages and how we interacted with each other, how the languages evolved, how the varieties evolved and how and why the languages also died. These are very fundamental questions which cannot be answered unless uh, the linguists, under the departments teach this. There is no doubt about the kind of uh, diversification that linguistics has taken place, especially in the engineering institutes and scientific institutes, because we certainly, that was the demand of the era and the age, like artificial intelligence, computational linguistics, and linguistics engineering now, as they say, because Google has started hiring a lot of linguists. So I'm very happy about that. But in addition to that, we have, we should not forget where the roots are of the discipline. And I'm really, we were trying to think, is there any department of linguistics now, as of today, which teaches historical linguistics and comparative linguistics? I don't think so. Calcutta University. So I'm not as disappointed as I started with. Uh, so there are still some hope. I would request other departments to follow the suit because this is this is an important aspect of uh, uh, the linguistics. I remember when I was a student of PhD, it was a pre PhD course. We had to do two courses in historical linguistics. You know, so I did one in Indo-European and one in historical and societal linguistics. In addition to do that. We had to do indo linguistics and Dravidian linguistics. So my upbringing came out with doing four different historical linguistics courses of different language families also and theoretical linguistics. But in addition to that, we were to do courses in classical language. 
which no department follows anymore. And uh, so since I already knew Sanskrit, uh, my university colleagues said, no, you have to do a classical language. Because you already know Sanskrit doesn't mean that you qualify you do an additional course or other course in Pali, you know. So this is what I'm, you know, this makes, makes your background very solid about uh, if people have not learned Sanskrit in this country, they should, or any classical language, why not Persian or Arabic, any language that you can have access to. So these are the things which have, so what I'm trying to say that the pedagogy, pedagogy of linguistics has had a paradigm shift since the 70s. And this shift is welcome, but it, it should not have discarded things that uh, the kind of subject that it had. So I hope that uh, it takes uh, over these and has, has includes these kind of subjects also in the learning and teaching. Uh, coming to the society, you know, when I took over six years ago, the society was running in very bad shape, let me tell you. Financially especially, <coughs> not otherwise. Financially, we didn't even have money to pay to the part-time person who used to, you know, paste the letters and stamp and send the journals to others. Well, we have come a long way. Now that not only that we can pay him well, that we can also pay our executive members sometimes to travel to attend the EC meetings. Thanks to the Union Council for Social Sciences and Research. And they came to our uh, to us for this. And uh, also thanks to the large number of membership. I think when I took over, there were something 800 members. Now we have more than 1,200. Not that I have done something. The Secretary, Surin Mohan, has been Challenge the moment has been very aggressive about it and I would request more and more people should become the member of the society so that the society keeps doing uh, the, uh, the, the job that they are entrusted to do. There's another important change that took place during this time. We always used to have AICL, All India Conference of Universities, but changed its uh, JAMA or Avatar. We have a new Avatar now and it is because it is the International Conference because we realize that we have many uh, uh, interaction with international scholars and many people send their papers and they cannot come. So why not do it in a, uh, this, this mean? So from AICL to EcoC, we have already, I think this is the fifth one. Uh, like first, first one was in, uh, uh, where was it? Kerala. Mysore. Mysore. First one was in Mysore, yes. So, uh, last time we were in Guwahati, IIT Guwahati. So I'm happy that the engineering institutes are coming forth to host it. So last time we had IIT Guwahati, now we are in IIT Patna. And uh, so we are very thankful that this, this change has been welcomed by many and it has also certainly improved our funding because the moment you have an international name, your funding improves. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the journal also had Change. The LSI journal was annual journal, which has now become a biannual, and that's because we are getting more and more papers, so we have now avenue to uh, publish more papers. In fact, last time I announced to the, announced all this from the podium that we would be very happy if someone gives us any information, the Michael Scare, a dictionary item, or any kind of ethnographic information on language which has not been explored before. And last year, because it was in Guwahati, there were many students from Northeast India. And I thought they would be motivated to do it, but I was surprised and a little disappointed they had not. So I just, uh, this offer goes on uh, me today that any of you, if you ever work on any language which has not been worked upon, and you are, you are doing it, whatever it is, shape it. We don't care because we'll get it and then we will improvise it. You can send it, just send it to the LSI uh, website. Uh, the, the, the address given there. So we would like to see that how much work young folks are doing you know, in this area. Uh, I will. I tried my best in the last six years to do as much as I could do, but if there are any uh, discrepancies, not discrepancies, but if there are any expectations that, I not, we have, uh, that, that we have not met, I alone would like to take the responsibility. And I hope the new executive uh, will uh, not only re rectify our mistakes, it will also take the society to a uh, higher scale, newer and better, in fact, higher scale, I'd say. I'm, um, 
I'd like to hand over now to the, I mean, not physically, I would be, that would be done in the GDM. I think we have a GDM today. But as I hand over the presidentship to a very a much younger and more energetic person, uh, I feel uh, very much, uh, uh, I should say, light again that somebody will be taking over who, who is much younger to me. And I'm very, I'm very sure uh, that he's entering an era where the government of India itself is interested in say, safeguarding the minority languages, as you call it, or what I call the marginalized languages, and the other smaller languages or endangered languages. So it's a very happy situation that you are taking the presidentship of the society because not this this situation was not present earlier. And I'm hopeful and have full confidence that this person will win your trust in augmenting research and linguistics and allied disciplines to uphold the aims and objectives of the Linguistic Society of India, uh, which was founded in 1928. Let 100 flowers bloom in the Linguistic Society of India.